Okay. Look, David. Okay. The uh, travelling between north and south is actually the bit of transport infrastructure that works. It's travelling across the north that doesn't work. So what would the cost have to reach of HS2 for the government to conclude that it no longer represents value for money for the taxpayer? Or am I right in thinking that the government is pursuing essentially a socialist policy of saying that irrespective of how much the final bill is for this ridiculous white elephant, it will still keep paying it irrespective of what it gets to? <laughs> I thank my honourable friend for his question. I did um, take the precaution of researching his interest in this subject, and I see 14 years ago he was challenging on this subject. Um, the government remains, as it did then, to be fully committed to delivering HS2 and the integrated rail plan. It is a long-term investment which will bring our biggest cities closer together. It will boost productivity and provide a low-carbon alternative to cars and planes for many decades to come. But as he also knows, we are also working through the IRP on a £96 billion package to improve rail connections interregionally, which obviously affects his constituents. Graham Stringer. Uh, Mr Speaker, does the Minister agree with me uh, that this country's per performance on productivity has been pitiful? over the last 10 years. There's been no, virtually no improvement in productivity. And one of the uh, reasons for that is our lack of investment in national infrastructure. Uh, slowing down HS2 is a bad move in improving our infrastructure. It has been years since we agreed to a third runway at Heathrow. Does the Minister agree yeah, that yeah. Uh, if we are to improve our productivity, we have to invest in infrastructure? Uh, I can agree with the honourable, right honourable gentleman that an investment of 600 billion, which this government has committed to on infrastructure in all parts of the country, is critical to easing uh, the productivity challenge that successive governments have had. And the Chancellor will be bringing forward further uh, measures uh, in the autumn statement to uh, address it further. Greg Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. HS2's costs have ballooned since it was first conceived under the last. Labour government. As my right honourable friend said, from pressure from the Treasury, it has had to be rephased and now goes from West London, not Central London, to a station not in Central Birmingham, negating any of the benefits proponents of the scheme brought about. With ballooning costs still further, we just can't afford it, can we? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't agree with my honourable friend. I've, uh, I've certainly recognised that infrastructure investments of this scale and this level of ambition are never easy to deliver, but I've set out the changes that we've made to the profile of that investment, but all the key elements remain on track and we'll continue to work with the department to make sure that continues. John Speller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr Speaker, but isn't the Minister also concerned about cost-benefit? And hasn't the pandemic, working from home and video conferencing, dramatically changed the assumptions behind yeah. the pattern of business travel uh, demand? Is he satisfied that the Transport Department have properly re-evaluated HS2 to take account of those changes? Minister. Yes, I am content of that, but, uh, with that, but I do recognise the changes that he's uh, pointing to in terms of patterns of behaviour in use of public transport. But we're also uh, facing cost of living challenges, and that's why we're working very closely with the Department of Transport, for example, to continue investment in buses over the next two years, continue to spend £200 million to cap fares for, to £2 outside of London. But we, we must be very clear that continued investment in transport infrastructure is key to greater connectivity uh, across the United Kingdom and uh, dealing with the economic uh, growth imperative that we have. Mr. McVeigh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been reported over the last couple of days that in order to accommodate HS2, it will mean there will be fewer trains between the North and London. One such station affected is Wilmslow in my constituency. So, would the Minister agree with me? If that were to happen, then HS2 would no longer be value for money or good for the North. It will certainly take longer and cost more for my constituents. Minister? 
Well, uh, HS2 is going to happen. The question is what additional investments across other parts of the rail infrastructure that might, may more directly and in addition uh, uh, benefit her constituents um, what are, are, are taking place. And I set out with the IRP, we have this £96 billion package to improve rail connections. Many elements will have a direct impact on her constituents in Cheshire. Andrew Bridgen. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister is well aware, North West Leicestershire has suffered under the blight of HS2 for over a decade. The whole project has recently been declared as undeliverable. It's been unaffordable for some considerable time. So, would the Minister urge his colleagues in government to cancel the remainder of the Eastern Leg and reallocate just a small portion of that budget so we can reopen the Ivanhoe line? Minister. Well, I also recognise the, the Honourable Gentleman has had strong views on that, and I know has been personally affected by it in the past. But the, the, the project, though it has been rephased, uh, will continue, and there are a number of uh, issues in terms of making sure that we get the management of that budget very tight going forward, and I'm working very closely with the Department of Transport to see that happens. Uh, Nadia Whitton. Question two, please, Mr Speaker. Minister. Good morning, Mr Speaker. I'd like to answer this question together with question number 16. The Treasury's 2021 net zero review no noted unmitigated climate change damage has been estimated to be equivalent to losing between 5 and 20 per cent of global GDP each year. The costs of global inaction significantly outweigh the costs of action, and McKinsey estimates that there is a global market opportunity for British businesses worth £1 trillion. Nadia Whittam. A recent report from Carbon Tracker found a huge disconnect between what scientists expect from climate change and what our financial system is prepared for, with flawed economic modelling leading pension funds and others to seriously underestimate the risks. Meanwhile, Energy UK warns that we're lagging behind on green energy investments. Surely the Minister agrees that to revive our economy and avert climate catastrophe, we must rapidly phase out fossil fuels and invest in a Green New Deal to reach net zero. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I think it's important to point out that we are the fastest decarbonising economy in the G7. Since 1990, yeah. we've decarbonised by 48 per cent, while growing our economy by 65 per cent. But she is right. It will take a balanced approach of both public uh, spending, but also private investment, including pension fund investment. And the recent pension fund reforms, for example, should unlock some new assets for green infrastructure. We're all about. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I um, insist on the question about the carbon tracker report? It has found that the policy decisions made are based on 1990s literature. That is 30 years old. So I'm asking, will the Chancellor review the data and the thinking that the government is using to make sure that all strands are in line with the climate science of the 21st century? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, the data that I look at shows that uh, last year 40 per cent of our electricity was generated from renewables, and I think that's an amazing achievement, but we are alive and present when it comes to decarbonising our economy. We're, we've got great plans uh, and building on our, a great track record, and we'll continue to do that. Welcome in the new member, Stephen yeah. Till. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my honourable friend agree with my Uxbridge and South Rysip constituents that Mayor Khan's ULES expansion hits families and businesses without any significant environmental benefit? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, Mr Speaker, let me welcome my honourable friend uh, to his place. He's wasting no time whatsoever in advocating for his constituents against a Labour tax that is hitting households and businesses in his constituency, but throughout the South East. It's a massive tax bombshell at a time when families just do not need it. It's simply not right, and we would urge the Leader of the Opposition to tell his Mayor of London to stop it. Richard Fuller. Speaker, the shadow Chancellor has said she won't rule out mandating the use of pension fund money behind the pet schemes the Labour Party think will help achieve net zero, putting at risk the savings of many pensioners in this country. What does my honourable friend think will be the impact of that on the British economy? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Pension funds have a fiduciary responsibility to deliver a financial return, but also be mindful of the values of its pensioners, and I have every confidence that pension funds will continue to invest uh, in line with the risk that is presented by climate. A banner of Pongasari, the Shadow Minister. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This Tory government effectively banned new onshore wind, which is vital for net zero, energy security and getting bills done. We now learn that this could change 
due to one of the following group of Tory rebels now shouting louder than another group of Tory rebels. Mm. There is no leadership, just government led by its backbenchers. Can we finally get an answer from the government today on whether they will dither and delay and join Labour, who is leading the way, to act on onshore wind? Yeah, yeah. Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, onshore wind has a really important part to play. We're already uh, deploying 14 gigawatts of energy from onshore, and the cost of onshore has come down significantly. It is one of our cheapest energy sources. She doesn't have long to wait for the energy bill, which is later today. We now come to Fleur Anderson. Question number three, Mr Speaker. Minister. Mr Speaker, over the course of 2022, high inflation from Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine saw interest rates increase across most Western economies. The path to lower rates now is through low inflation, which is why the Prime Minister made halving inflation one of our five priorities for this year. And I'm pleased that the latest Bank of England forecast shows that we're on track. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mortgage and associated renting costs are soaring in Putney, Roehampton, and Southfields, and the government yet again likes to claim it's all due to global shocks or the war in Ukraine. But the latest Bank of England data from July shows that le- the cost of lending to buy a home remains higher in the UK than Germany, Italy, or France. Will the minister finally concede that this difference? is that they did not have the devastating growth plan or mini-budget last year, and it's because of this government's wider economic failure that my constituents face these costs. Uh, Mr Speaker, I am glad that her constituents, amongst many others, will benefit from both our support for mortgage interest, uh, for the fact that there are now almost double the number uh, of mortgage products on the market than there were in October 2022. But to repeat uh, the comment of my earlier colleague, if she is so worried about her constituents, uh, what better way of helping them with the cost of living than to do away with the Mayor's ULES tax? Anthony Brown. Th- thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the UK, home buyers are overwhelmingly dependent on short term fixed rate mortgages of just two, three, or five years. And that means, in times of rising interest rates, as we have at the moment, they get hard hit by massively increasing mortgage bills. But in most other countries, home buyers have long term fixed rate mortgages of 10 years, 20 years, or fixed rate for the entire length of the mortgage. Does my right honourable friend or my honourable friend agree that the, the regulators should ensure a level playing fail, field between short term and long term mortgages to give home buyers a free choice of what sort of mortgage they want and so they can choose to get greater protection against rate rises if they want? Uh, well, my honourable friend um, has great knowledge of these matters. Uh, it was a privilege to work with him uh, and the sector to look at how we can offer consumers and home buyers more choice. That choice includes the opportunity of long term fixed rate mortgages, and I and my officials continue to work on how we can reduce frictions and barriers to those. We, can I welcome Durham Jones, the new Shadow Minister? Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. This month, it is estimated that 140,000 households will face a rise in their mortgage bills. If we take a random constituency, Mr Speaker, say mid-Bedfordshire, I understand that if someone were to remortgage their house in the next six months, they could be paying an average of £300 more per month compared to before the disastrous Tory mini-budget this time last year. So what can the Chancellor and his team do to reassure the country that if the Conservatives were to win the next election, they won't just mess up the economy all over again. Minister. The over 90% of mortgage providers have signed up to our mortgage charter uh, that offers the opportunity for relief to term out uh, mortgages and to have interest-free periods uh, if they face adversity uh, at this time when interest rates are high across the world. But what won't help the constituents of Mid-Bedfordshire, Mr Speaker, is unfunded spending promises that we know will push up the cost of borrowing and defer the point at which inflation falls. Darren Jones. Uh, That's a bit rich from the Government, Mr Speaker, and it's no answer whatsoever to the people of Mid-Bedfordshire who will not be able to afford to pay their bills over the coming months. It is one year ago today that the former Tory Prime Minister took a huge ideological gamble and sabotaged Britain's economy. They crashed the pound, put pensions in peril, and exploded a Tory mortgage bombshell under the homes of millions of working people. So will the Minister take this opportunity to apologise to the British people on behalf of the Conservative Party for wrecking their hopes and aspirations? 
Well, the, uh, the, I, I welcome the, uh, the honourable member to his position, and uh, he, he's had a feisty morning reading his uh, his Woolworth Road brief. Uh, however, uh, I'd also offer, offer the, uh, the, opportu- the opportunity to the honourable member. Uh, to, him, to himself correct the record, uh, Labour has spent the last 12 months talking down our economy, an economy that is now larger than it was when we entered Covid, and that has recovered and grown faster than both France and Germany. Yeah. Dr Philippa Whitford. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Question for Mr Speaker. Chancellor. Good morning, Mr Speaker. And with your permission, I would like to take this with the questions 5 and 12. Brexit was a choice made by the British people remains a big opportunity for the economy, and rather than relitigating that debate, this gov- government is committed to embracing those opportunities. Dr. Philippa Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Prior to the EU referendum, the Bank of England warned Brexit would seriously damage the UK economy, yep. weakening the pound and causing inflation. The government has now delayed import checks on animal and food products for the fifth time because the costs would add to inflation. So does that mean the Chancellor finally accepts Brexit is contributing to the UK's cost of living crisis? No, but of course we are sensitive about the timing of introducing those changes because of cost of living pressures. Can I say that I'm sad to see, uh, since we met in this House previously, that she has announced she is stepping down. We have much in common on patient safety. And when it comes to the NHS, she will know that because of Brexit, an extra £14.6 billion is being directed to public services every year, including the NHS and including in Scotland. Alison yeah. Thulis. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Adam Posen, the former member of the Monetary Policy Committee, has described Brexit as a trade war by the UK on itself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this unnecessary trade war has had a real impact on small businesses in my constituency, like Guild Antiques and Restoration, who have found that their orders from the EU have fallen off a cliff edge and their costs have increased. Scotland didn't choose Brexit, and we're all worse off as a result. Yeah, yeah. So, what can the Chancellor do to fill the economic gaps his hard Brexit has caused? Chancellor. Mr Speaker, there is a sad irony in the SNP opposing Brexit as, at the same time as advocating a far more draconian separation for Scotland, including a new currency and border checks. But when it comes to businesses in Scotland, as part of the UK, Scotland is now an independent coastal state for the first time in nearly half a century. The 21,000 people in Scotland who work in financial services are benefiting from the Brexit freedoms in the Edinburgh reforms. And there's extra support for Scottish pubs because, for the first time, we have a lower beer duty relative to supermarkets. Yeah. Absolutely clutch. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's not just Brexit. Trade barriers having a devastating impact on Scotland's economy. The loss of freedom of movement has hugely damaged our businesses' yeah, ability yeah. to recruit staff. Many businesses have had to reduce their offer, cut their opening hours, or close altogether. And over the bank holiday, it's estimated UK pubs alone lost out on £22 million because of staff shortages. Does the Chancellor actually accept small businesses like these can't keep picking up the tab for his government's disastrous Brexit? And what is he doing to solve these staff recruitment problems? Yeah, yeah. Chancellor, can I gently say to the Honourable Lady that this country has actually grown faster than France? or Germany since we left the single market. And I think this is a bit of a smokescreen for the SNP's own economic policies, which have led to more people out of work and fewer people in work than in England. Even the EU gives us the opportunity to modernise our regulations and adapt them to local and national domestic interests. But we will only seize the benefits of doing that if we deliver on regulatory reform. So will he drive this across government departments so we can increase prosperity and raise living standards as a result? Uh, Well, no one knows more about regulatory reform than my right honourable friend, and she wrote an excellent booklet on it. Um, And we look at that booklet ahead of every fiscal event, whether autumn statements and budgets. And I, I hope she noticed in the budget big reforms to our medicines regulation, and we will continue to learn from the things she advocates. Thank you, Ford. Mr Speaker, for generations, Britain's world leadership on financial services and financial markets has been a key part of our economy, and I agree that the post-Brexit initiatives, like the Edinburgh Review, have made excellent strides on making sure we keep that world leadership. Can I encourage him to look at the report from UK Finance on tokenisation of markets as being the world leader in this innovative area? 
would reduce costs for investors, enable money to flow into less liquid assets and fundamentally unlock future growth. Chancellor. Well, I thank my honourable friend for her question, and thanks to the excellent work of the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, we have repealed 100 EU rules and regulations in the financial services sector, and we will look very closely at the opportunities when it comes to tokenisation. Shalim Sadiq, Shadow Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the Government admitted that their planned introduction of food import checks from the EU would lead to an increase in inflation hitting the pockets of ordinary people during the worst cost-of-living crisis in our lifetimes. In the Labour Party, we believe that a bespoke veterinary agreement would cut red tape from business and avoid pushing on costs onto ordinary people. So could I ask the Minister, is the Government planning to negotiate a veterinary agreement? And if not, why not? Can I gently say to the Honourable Lady, who I have a lot of time for, that the last thing business wants is the upheaval of a huge renegotiation of our trading arrangement with the EU, which is the largest tariff-free, volume-free trade deal in the world. Can I welcome Drew Hendry? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Let's see if the Chancellor claims as a success that inflation in the UK has risen higher and remained more stubbornly so than in the EU. Adam Posen, formerly of the Bank of England, has underlined that up to 80 per cent of the UK's additional inflation woes can be laid at the door of Brexit, something the Tories and Labour are united on. All the while, food price inflation is crushing household budgets. So why has this government done nothing? Why has this government learnt nothing from countries like France, who have worked with food suppliers to keep food prices capped so that they can help those most in need? Well, first of all, can I welcome the Honourable Gentleman to his position. And I, I note that his constituency predecessor actually served as a minister in the Treasury. And whatever greatness he goes on to, I'm sure he won't sully himself with that uh, role in that way. Um, when it comes to inflation, um, we um, have high level of imported food like Germany, uh, high level of imported gas like Italy, and low unemployment like the United States. And these factors have come together to give us the inflation rate we have. But when it comes to growth, he will have noted last week's numbers that show that we have recovered better from the pandemic than France, Italy or Germany, um, and we are doing extremely well despite all the pressures we face. Drew Henry. Mr Speaker, I noticed the Chancellor didn't talk about anything about food price inflation hurting families. Well, Tory and Labour Little Britain attitudes don't stop at food price inaction. Energy costs are a key driver of inflation and costs for families. Energy bills are too high. The Spanish have taken bold steps by cutting VAT and introducing a social tariff to help their people. This government planned to do nothing for this winter. So and that's particularly galling for people in Scotland who will continue to pay more for their energy than elsewhere in the UK. So will the Chancellor act on our demands to have that four hundred pound energy price grant introduced this winter? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let me uh, tell the Honourable Gentleman what we're doing for his constituents and indeed all the people of Scotland. Around £3,000 of support for the average family in the country, up and down the country, including in Scotland, paying half people's energy bills on average. Huge amount of support through the benefit system. Nearly £100 billion of support, which shows that we are stronger together. Yeah. Mary Kelly Foy. Thank you, Mr. S uh, number six. Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government is committed to supporting individuals to live healthier lives. High inflation is the greatest immediate economic challenge that we must address. The government has made it a priority to halve inflation this year. We're on the path back to that target of 2%, and CPI inflation fell to 6.8% in July. Uh, we will continue to work with all departments to deal with the inflationary pressures they face. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Being unable to pay for essentials like food, heating and rent has an impact on someone's physical and mental health. It can lead to delayed diagnosis, malnutrition and serious mental health problems. And I'm sure, as the, the former Health Secretary will know, prevention is better than cure. But austerity flies in the face of a preventative approach. 
So what discussions has he had with the Health Minister to ensure the NHS is, has prevention at its heart and will we see a rise in funding in the autumn statement? Minister. I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. Yes, I have frequent conversations with the Secretary of State and other Ministers about health budgets. We will be increasing the public health grant to £3.575 billion for the next financial year. That is to ensure that we have that real-term funding uh, protection over the next two years. But there, there are a number of other interventions that we're making in terms of delivering services more effectively, ensuring that we have the provision of additional staff with the long-term workforce plan for the NHS. But I do recognise the challenges that the NHS faces post-COVID in terms of the legacy of demand that is yet unmet. We're continuing to work to bring waiting lists down, and we've seen significant progress, particularly with two-year and 18-month lists recently. The Hollow Bell. key part of improving the public health and well-being of my local residence in Kettering is the redevelopment of Kettering General Hospital. Can the Chief Secretary confirm that the £400 million plus redevelopment of KGH uh, remains on track for completion by 2030 and that the standardisation of the design of the 40 new hospitals will help reduce costs and increase deliverability? Kettering <laughs> Hospital is always top of mind when I come to <laughs> Treasury questions, but the bigger uh, challenge, as he rightly points out, is how do we ensure the efficiency of the expenditure of every pound of taxpayers' uh, investment in, in the health estate? And I'll continue to work with the Secretary of State uh, on that plan for the 40 hospitals to make sure we achieve that. Derek Twig. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Can, can, can I ask the Minister this? Is in the many discussions he's had, which he said he has had with the Secretary of State for Health, what figure did he discuss with him that he thinks or estimates that inflation will be up next in the next financial year? <clears throat> well, there, there are a range of forecasts. Uh, we have to deal with the reality. Um, what I'm trying to ensure is that across all of the decisions Secretaries of State make, that we reprioritise effectively, deliver frontline services. Um, but I, I don't have a number for him this afternoon. Jonathan Gillis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. People in Stoke-on-Trent, North, Kidsgrove and Talk will find mental health as a huge barrier to actually getting back into work and obviously helping to produce economic growth, something the Chancellor has been reported to be considering carefully over the summer recess. My friend and I, James Starkey, launched a No Time to Wait campaign to use some existing health and social care funding to get specialist mental health nurses into GP surgeries to help support people in a more preventative way, as asked by the Honourable Lady earlier. What support will the Treasury give in getting the Department for Health and Social Care to enact these plans? Minister. Well, my honourable friend always has constructive suggestions in this difficult area, and obviously the budget for the Chancellor brought forward a number of interventions to get people uh, back into work after some of the behavioural shifts we saw following the pandemic, and we look forward to continuing to work with him on solutions for his community. David Dewey. Question number seven, Mr Speaker. Chancellor. With permission, Mr Speaker, I'd like to take this with question 15. Industrial zones are part of our industrial strategy to make sure the benefits of our national strengths in our five growth priority sectors are spread throughout the UK. <coughs> thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank my right honourable friend for his response. The North East of Scotland has long been an exemplar of innovation in the fields of food and drink and energy, to name a few. Uh, can my right honourable friend confirm that the North East Scotland Investment Zone will lead to more innovation to promote these key industries, not just in Aberdeen City, but in the wider North East, including my constituency of Banff and Buchan. Chancellor. Well, I know that the ACORN CCUS project is based in St Fergus in his patch, and Banff and Buchan is within the North East of Scotland region, which is one of two eligible areas uh, and has been a long uh, standing global centre for excellence in clean energy. So I wish him every success as those discussions continue with the Scottish Government. Sean Benz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Chancellor agree with me that my constituency of Clwyd South, that of my honourable friend, the member for Wrexham, and the rest of North East Wales represent one of the best candidates for a new investment zone? And would you also consider making this cross border, given our very close economic, commercial, and cultural ties yeah. with the northwest of England? 
Chancellor. Well, I, I know there are some great businesses in this constituency, and I much enjoy meeting Robin and Helen Jones from the Jones Village Bakery at a recent reception in Number 10, and I know they're going from strength to strength. I holidayed in Clwyd last year, and from the top of Mulvama, I saw uh, a very impressive offshore wind farm, and I completely agree with him. There is enormous potential in Clwyd for clean energy, and, um, and as discussions continue about investment zones, I wish him as well every success. Dan Jarvis. Speaker, the UK's first investment zone is in South Yorkshire, where the Mayor is working hard to develop our world-leading Advanced Manufacturing Innovation District. Now, I'm sure the Chancellor will agree that if we're going to create a growth area, we need to make sure that people can access the jobs there via transport links, particularly by bus. So, will he make sure that included within the financial package available is money to assist with local public transport? Chancellor. Well, I very much enjoyed my visit to South Yorkshire to open that investment zone, and I think it's incredibly impressive what's happening there. And uh, it was wonderful to welcome new investment by Boeing uh, as part of that. He's right to talk about transport, and that's why we involve local authorities in all our investment zone decisions. And it's also vital to have universities involved, which, which is why the University of Sheffield is playing such a key role. Clyde bet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I was actually present on the day when the Chancellor came to uh, launch the investment zone in my constituency, uh, and of course welcomed the investment into Boeing there as well. Would you accept that one of the other areas for future development with the investment zone are small modular reactors? Uh, and there is a consortium being developed now uh, in Sheffield with Sheffield Forge Masters, Rolls Royce, Hitachi, starting to look at the future, not merely to develop the actual techniques for SMRs, but to actually start building SMRs in Sheffield. Would he be willing to look at that proposal and hopefully offer support for it? Chancellor. Well, um, I enjoyed meeting the uh, right honourable gentleman when, he, when we opened that investment zone. Let me reassure him, I'm a big supporter of nuclear um, and very excited about the potential of SMRs. Uh, there's a competition going on this year, which we hope will be complete by the end of this year, uh, to assess the viability of the various SMR manufacturers, and we want to get going as quickly as we can. Michael Long. Question number eight, please, Mr Speaker. Minister. Mr Speaker, the government has been clear that debanking customers on the basis of political views is unacceptable. During recess, I met with banking executives to discuss debanking and lawful freedom of expression, and they have committed to comply with the changes I published on the 21st of July. In parallel, the FCA is conducting an urgent review of debanking practices, which will report back to the Chancellor in the next couple of weeks. Mark Oldham. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. So, last week, the uh, Met Police Chief finally seemed to confirm that the police's job should be to police and not to seek to align itself to entities or ideologies. Does the Minister agree with me that banks and the corporate world should follow this example and focus their efforts on their core business rather than play the sinister cancelling agenda of the woke brigade that saw Nigel Farage have his account wrongfully closed. Minister. Well, my honourable friend for Dudley North represents the views of his constituents in this place very clearly. He is quite right, Mr Speaker. Although they are private entities, banks do benefit from a privileged place in society, and they should focus on doing their core functions brilliantly well, treating customers fairly, making a sustainable return for shareholders, rather than taking sides on politically contentious matters. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and, and I thank the Minister for that response. Today, Minister, it is because some people may have a different political view tomorrow. It could be, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it could be the actual fact that somebody has a different religious viewpoint. I mean, I'm a Christian. I stand up for those as APPG chair of those with Christian beliefs, those with other beliefs, and those with no beliefs. Because I do believe sincerely that you have a right to have that belief. Ever the day comes that banks would uh, uh, censure anybody because they have a different religious belief would be something I would step up for. Does the Minister agree with that? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, let me be clear. Yes, uh, the Government does agree with that. Uh, no one should be debarred from access to banking facilities in our society for lawfully expressed views. Uh, if he and other honourable members uh, wish to make representations, the Financial Conduct Authority is currently conducting a review of this matter. Question 9, Mr Speaker. Minister. 
Mr Speaker, in April this year, the Government announced it would conduct a formal evaluation of the plastic packaging tax through analysis of environmental and tax data, as well as customer research to assess the impact of the measure. More information about the evaluation will be published later this year. I thank uh, the Minister for his response. and am pleased to share that a business in my Eastbourne constituency has made many important changes to the way it operates to meet its own environmental ambitions. But when it comes to the transportation of food and pharmaceutical products, is it the case that industry standards linked to regulations on public health require these products to be transported in sterile packaging, which necessitates the use of virgin plastics and bringing the containers the business produces into scope for PTT? Is there a new direction I can share with my business, or will ongoing policy reviews look at cases such as these? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, the aim of the plastic packaging tax is to provide a clear incentive for businesses to use more recycled plastic. Uh, uh, recycled plastic in packaging. Following extensive consultation, we looked at a range of possible exemptions and decided to limit those exemptions because we want to encourage uh, innovation in the industry. Put very simply, the more exemptions, the less innovation. However, all taxes, of course, remain under review. Colin McCarthy. A proactive approach to a circular economy could mean the creation of hundreds of thousands of jobs, as well as cutting our consumption emissions. What circular taxation measures is the Treasury looking at that would help us to achieve those outcomes? Uh, well, Minister, we um, are very clear that we want all these taxes to do with the environment to have an impact. If you take the plastic packaging tax, that clearly will have an impact on the amount of recycling, recycling that takes place, the amount that um, is put into landfill. These are all things that we assess as part of evaluations, and the plastic packaging tax will be evaluated this year. Jill Mills. Number 10, please, sir. Minister. Mr Speaker, at Mansion House, the Government presented a series of reforms to pensions which will increase returns for savers and enable the financial sector to unlock capital for some of the UK's most promising industries. The Department is continuing work to build on the initial package of measures and will set out further details in the autumn. Nigel Mills. I thank the Minister for his answer and welcome those measures. Have the Government looked at the issue of surpluses now in defined benefit schemes and what more could be done to unlock those and allow employers to use that money more effectively rather than it ended up effectively going into insurance companies on, on buyouts? I mean, there's a huge tax penalty on unlocking surpluses. Is there a way of perhaps relieving that to encourage that money to be invested more efficiently? Minister. Uh, well, the, uh, my hon. Friend makes an important point, and with the right precautions, uh, it is right that we look at that to incentivise employers uh, to deliver the highest returns uh, for pension savers. Stephanie Peacock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government have taken £4.4 billion to date from the Mine Workers' Pension Scheme. The Cross Party Base Select Committee concluded that the Government should not be profiting from mine workers' pensions. How does the Secretary of State justify their continued profiteering? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd be very happy to. I'm not familiar with the issue that the, the honourable lady speaks about. I'd be very happy to uh, meet with her uh, and understand that in more detail. Catherine Fletcher. Number eleven, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are ensuring that pubs remain a key part of our local communities by providing support through the alcohol duty and business rate system. Uh, this includes a new draft relief that provides a significant duty discount on alcohol sold on draft in a pub, and the expanded retail hospitality and leisure relief means over £10,000 in relief for the average independent pub. Catherine Fletcher. Mr Speaker, um, after a busy summer knocking around South Ribble speaking to people, I've often popped for a pint such in Croston's famous wheat sheaf. From housing MP surgeries, as I know they do for many, to, I would argue, being our kind of community's living rooms, pubs are absolutely vital. Um, speaking to landlords like at the Black Bull or the fabulous Fleece in Penwitham, um, you, yeah, yeah, no, listen, I, there's, there's, a, there's a pub crawl there for all of us. They do need our support. So, can I invite the Minister to South Ribble? I'll even offer to buy her a pint. I get her to come and speak to the landlord Chris at Longton's fabulous Golden Ball and hear about his business. Hey. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, as you know, I, uh, I regard uh, Lancashire as uh, my home and it will be a delight to return to South Ribble. Uh, my honourable friend has named just a few 
of the roughly 37,000 pubs in England and Wales. Uh, perhaps if we give her longer, she'll be able to name them all. But all of those pubs will benefit from the Brexit pubs guarantee, which means that duty on a pint sold in a pub will always be lower than in a supermarket. Let's see if you're going to get another pint. Tim Furrow. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, I Following my, my dad's MP, I confess that I've actually been to all of the pubs that she's mentioned. <laughs> um, but uh, the biggest burden on pubs in the Lakes and the Dales is actually the fact that they cannot find any staff or yeah. sufficient staff. Oh. It is a crisis that affects yeah. the entire hospitality sector, 86% of which say that the recruitment of staff is a major problem for them. The solution will include uh, more affordable homes for workers, uh, more intelligent visa rules and funding new training and skills initiatives. So would the uh, Minister meet with me and representatives of the hospitality industry to look at a bespoke package to solve the workforce crisis in the Lakes and the Dales? Very good. Well, Mr Another Speaker, push. I'd actually go further and I'd give as an example the truly transformational programme that the Chancellor set out uh, at Spring Budget to uh, transform childcare policy in this country. We know that childcare responsibilities hold back many people from entering the workforce and it is through policies such as this, as well as the work being led by the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, to help people back into the workforce that will help pubs in his constituency and across the country. We now come to Topitals, Elliot Colbert. The call number one, Mr Speaker. Councillor. Mr Speaker, on Friday, the Office for National Statistics published an update to the UK's GDP growth figures, which shows the UK economy was 0.6 per cent larger than pre-pandemic levels by the fourth quarter of 2021. It means our economy had the fastest recovery from the pandemic of any large European economy, thanks to decisions such as furlough that protected millions of jobs. For that growth to continue, we now need to halve inflation, which I'm pleased to report is now nearly 40 per cent below its 11 per cent peak. I can also tell the House I will deliver the autumn statement on the 22nd of November. Elliot Colbert. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Keeping on the subject of pubs, if I may, Carshalton and Wallington is also lucky to be home to some excellent pubs, including The Hope, which is this year's Camera Greater London Pub of the Year recipient. Could the Chancellor expand a bit more on the work that the Treasury is doing to support pubs, not just in the tax system, but further afield? And will he join me in wishing Carshalton and Wallington pubs good luck in the local Pub of the Year competition later on? (laughs) Well, I uh, very much do um, wish his local pubs the best of luck in that competition, um, second only to my desire to encourage South West Surrey pubs to do well. And I want to reassure him that we uh, believe that pubs are central to our national life. Um, it's why we have provided relief to business rates of um, up to 75% for pubs. And as we heard earlier, the Brexit pubs guarantee helps on their duty price. Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, thousands of parents were told that their children's schools were unsafe and at risk of collapse. The defining image of 13 years of Conservative government classrooms propped up to stop the ceilings from falling in. Now, capital budgets have halved in real terms since 2010, with warnings ignored and repair programmes slashed. Does this Conservative government take any responsibility for any of this? Chancellor. Well, let me start by reassuring the Honourable Lady that the vast majority of pupils in the 156 schools affected are at school normally, and we're acting fast to minimise the impact on the rest. But let me answer the more general question that she raised directly. Yes, we made cuts in spending in 2010, because as she knows well, the last Labour government left this country with an economic crisis. And despite that, the Department for Education budget, despite that crisis, has gone up by 15 per cent in real terms, Mr Speaker. Um, And overall capital spent... Sorry about this. It's Topitals. All your colleagues do want to get in on both sides. Topitals are meant to be very short, not into a full debate between both sides. And I do say that to her. Think about the others, Chancellor. I think we can move on. Rachel Reeves. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. I will repeat, capital budgets have halved in real terms since 2010. Now, I understand, indeed I know, that in the lead-up to the 2021 spending review, the Department for Education made a submission to the Treasury about the dangerous deteriorating school estate, including from RAC. 
These warnings were ignored by the then Chancellor, the current Prime Minister, and we have seen the consequences. So, will today's Chancellor do the right thing and publish the Department for Education submission to the last spending review? Capital spending at the Department for Education went up 16 per cent in real terms in that review. Isn't the difference that, with the fastest recovery in Europe, Conservatives build an economy that can pay for our schools and hospitals and Labour run out of money? Mr Speaker, for months we have had the Labour economics team running down British businesses, berating them for not growing fast enough and ignoring the fact the OECD shows the British economy has grown faster since 2010 than Germany, Italy, Spain or France. With the ONS upgrade recently announced, the Treasurer just referred to, what is his more hopeful message to British businesses? Chancellor. It is very simply this. But since 2010, we have become the strongest economy in Europe in film and TV, in life sciences, um, in technology, and the opportunities are great with a Conservative government. Ian Waverley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, the schools have failed to reopen due to the threat of collapse. Worryingly, Mr. Speaker, the danger doesn't end there because 95% of schools and public buildings are estimated to contain asbestos, described by Mesothelioma UK as a silent killer. Chancellor, will you stop ignoring your own department and commit to providing the necessary funding so that our children can be prevented from being taught in crumbling asbestos ridden death traps? Mm. Oh, Minister. I don't accept that characterisation at all. I do understand the impact of mesothelioma, as my father died of it, but this government has invested £15 billion invested to keep schools safe since 2015, and the Chancellor set out other figures as well. The Apollo Bell. A million calls went unanswered at the HMRC last year. Of those who did get through, two thirds had to wait more than 10 minutes. Meanwhile, four out of five HMRC staff are working from home. What is being done to improve the appalling level of customer service at HMRC? Minister. Mr Speaker, may I thank my honourable friend for his uh, question, which I take very, very seriously. Uh, Just to put this in context, last year HMRC received 38 million telephone calls, around 3 million of which are to do the simplest of tasks, which can be done digitally, if at all possible. If we are able to move people onto digital channels, that will free up at least 500 people to be able to help more complex tax affairs and to help the most vulnerable. This is a period of transition for the organisation and one which we take very, very seriously. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I recently conducted an energy survey in Dalmarmuk, which brought heartbreaking stories of pensioners going to bed early to save money on their energy and many households failing to pay, struggling to pay the bills even in the summer. Does not the Minister agree that the Dalmarmuk residents and people right across Scotland would benefit from a, a £400 energy rebate this winter, as the SNP propose? Mr. Mr. Speaker, we stepped in uh, during the energy crisis with £94 billion of support, including the energy price guarantee, which effectively paid for half of people's energy bills. That was important while energy prices were high. Wholesale gas prices have now come down. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as the Minister knows, free access to cash is a vital lifeline for many people, including some of the most vulnerable in all of our constituencies. So can he confirm what steps he's taken to ensure that this free access is protected? and continues to be available across the country, particularly in North Warwickshire and Bedworth. Minister. Uh, during, the, thank you, Mr. Speaker. during the summer, we announced that uh, we have given directions to the Financial Conduct Authority in respect of access to cash. It should be no more than one mile in an urban area, no more than three miles uh, in his, consti- his rural constituency in North Warwickshire. That is the first time that statutory right of access to cash exists in law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Prison officers tell me they are a breaking point, and a key, key source of despair and anger is their pension age of 68, which we should all agree is far too late. As the Treasury leads public sector pension scheme policy, will the Chancellor allow the MOJ to restart negotiations to resolve this grossly unfair and dangerous situation? Minister. Well, I'm very, I haven't heard that uh, matter raised before. I'm very happy to take that back and correspond with her on it. Uh, obviously, we've taken advice on the state pension age and we've made clear our policies previously, but I'm happy to look at any specific cases uh, she raises. David do it. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I ask my right honourable friend, when will a fiscal review of all offshore energy activity uh, be carried out to ensure we are maximising investment 
opportunities in critical energy infrastructure like offshore wind, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, as well as, while we still need it, domestic oil and gas? Well, he's absolutely right to raise that. I actually had a breakfast with uh, clean energy industry representatives this morning to discuss their concerns. There is a huge amount of potential investment, and he's absolutely right to say that maximising the use of our own oil and gas reserves during transition is a vital part of our energy security policy. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Chancellor consider introducing a windfall tax on banks' excess profits? The profits of the big four banks for the first half of this year were up 700 per cent compared to 2020, yet the Bank of England is forecast to pay out as much as £42 billion of interest on reserves to banks in 2023, at the same time as the Government has cut the level of surcharge on banks' profits by 60 per cent. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, with millions of British jobs dependent on financial services, including an estimated 20,000 jobs in Brighton and Hove, I hope the Hon. Lady would join me in celebrating a sustainably profitable financial sector. It is only that that gives us the ability to invest in skills and technology. Yeah. the Treasury Committee. Harriet Baldwin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could the Economic Secretary update the House on the progress he's making to enable our constituents to access personalised financial guidance if they're part of the 93 per cent of uh, constituents who can't afford regulated financial advice? Minister. Well, my honourable friend and chair of the Treasury Select Committee makes a really important point about what's called the advice gap. Uh, Treasury officials, myself and the FCA, uh, are all consulting on that, and I'll be publishing an update this autumn. Richard Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It has been revealed that Integrated uh, Debt Services, a company set up by the UK Government to recover personal debt, saw its profits increase by a staggering 132% last year. Do ministers think it is right that this company should be able to profit to that extent out of the misery of the cost of living crisis? The, uh, the Honourable Gentleman is referring to a company that works uh, with the Government's Crown Commercial Services. That works for debt across central government. Uh, and it, they are to operate within a very specific framework, uh, and indeed they are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, I very much understand the point he has raised, and I will be making inquiries on that point myself. R&D tax credits are vital to help yeah. businesses grow and invest, but I have received a large number of complaints from businesses across Essex saying that they are facing complexities and delays in processing claims of HMRC. Um, may I please ask the Minister to meet with me and some of these businesses to actually work through these delays and ensure that these businesses can continue to thrive and grow because they are vital to our economic growth? I would be delighted to meet my right honourable friend uh, and the businesses she sets out. In fact, the UK is leading uh, world economies with our focus on life sciences and on tech. In that little golden triangle between Oxford, Cambridge and London, we have more tech businesses on the planet than anywhere else other than New York and Silicon Valley. I hear the cheers opposite, so keen are they to uh, support British business. But, uh, the, but uh, I'd be delighted to meet her and to absolutely underline the support that this government gives to such important uh, businesses. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the new focus on engaging pension funds with productive uh, investment after many years when regulation has pushed the funds into government gilts instead. But does the Minister have proposals specifically to secure those investments for UK businesses rather than going overseas? Minister. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the Honourable Member um, makes a, a, a significant contribution to the debate about the nation's pension funds. Uh, our objective to increase investment, both to drive increased returns for pension savers, but also to the benefit of the wider economy, stop short of mandating. There is a philosophical difference uh, between this side of the House uh, and the opposition. Uh, we don't believe it's right for the Chancellor to tell pension funds where to invest, but it is our job to knock down barriers, frictions and impedances to pension funds investing in the brilliant British companies. David Davis. The Minister just told my honourable friend that he's going to underwrite the statutory right to access to cash, but 6,000 bank branches will have closed by the end of the year, leaving only 4,000 in place. 15,000 ATMs have closed in the last five years. How is he going to make sure this actually happens, rather than just an empty promise? Yeah. Minister. Yeah. 
Um, the FCA have significant sanctions in respect of uh, the closure of ATMs that would leave those communities without the right of free access to cash. Uh, in terms of the closure of bank branches, we are seeing a very significant change. And I hope uh, my honourable friend would respect the fact that technology is changing, consumer patterns are changing. During the recess, I had the privilege of visiting the excellent uh, community banking hub in Brixham. I think that's a brilliant opportunity. There should be more than 100 on their way, and it's my objective to. That many people look at income tax rates at the moment as being exceptionally punitive, and would he also accept that there is a need, quickly as possible, to move into a growth-based economy and supercharge our economy in the United Kingdom? Chancellor. Well, as a Conservative, I want to bring taxes down as soon as we can afford to do so, and I am very proud that, for the first time ever, you can earn a thousand pounds a month without paying a penny of yeah. tax or national insurance. Yeah. Bob Blackman, <laughs> Speaker. As we want to expand our financial services industry, not only in this country but abroad, we need to build confidence amongst consumers that it's the right thing to do to invest. So does my honourable friend agree with me that it's absolutely vital that the regulators respond and deal with complaints to them and actually impose sanctions against those that breach them? Minister. Yes, I agree with my honourable friend on this matter. It's one reason why we have beefed up the role of the Financial Regulators Review Commissioner. Another is that we'll be requiring the regulators to publish regular operating metrics on their performance to give consumers the trust they need. Next, man. Mr Speaker, back in 2017, both the Treasury and the Financial Conduct Authority knew there were problems with the prepaid funeral plan market. Since then, my constituent, Gary Godwin of Nanty Glow, lost over £6,000 to the collapse of a company called Safe Hands. Across the UK, thousands more have lost millions altogether. So can I ask the Minister, will he please meet with me to discuss the scandal and Mr Godwin's case? Minister. Yes, uh, I'll be very happy to meet with my friend. What happened in Safe Hands is a scandal, and that is why we have enlarged the regulatory perimeter to bring those who seek to sell funeral plans within the regulatory conduct. Stephen Crabb. Speaker, over the summer, ports have been bidding into the government's infrastructure fund to help them get ready for the delivery of the new floating offshore wind industry. Could I encourage ministers to look favourably on the bids from the Celtic Sea ports of Milford Haven and Port Talbot, because those two ports are key to unlocking the enormous economic benefits of this new clean energy industry? Chancellor. I am absolutely happy to do that, and I agree with him about the enormous potential of those areas. Daisy Cooper. Mr Speaker, uh, some GP practices are at risk of being um, priced out of city centres, including in places like St Albans, because of outdated Treasury rules that prevent ICBs from spending the money they want to on a GP practice location. Um, health ministers have confirmed to me that their officials are happy to work with Treasury officials. Could I please ask for a personal assurance from Treasury ministers that you will encourage your officials to look at this and resolve it um, absolute latest by the end of this year? Dialogue is ongoing on this matter, and I can, can confirm that we will continue to work on this in the coming weeks. Second batter. Speaker, Andy Haldane, the former Bank of England chief economist, recently said in a Sky News interview that the Bank of England kept on printing money for longer than it needed to. It's clear that central banks across the world have been addicted to cheap money, and this has contributed to inflation across the world. Does the Chancellor agree with me that printing cheap and, uh, cheap and easy money has not been without consequence? Instead, our monetary policy must focus on important growth factors like productivity. But Chancellor. Well, I, I do agree with what he says, and all I would say is the Bank of England themselves have said that there were problems with their inflation forecasting. Uh, they are learning the lessons from that, and we must support them every step of the way as they bring down inflation. British Air. Speaker, sorry I was late today. British Airways cancelled my flight. Uh, can I ask the Chancellor that when the, his predecessor, the now Prime Minister, <laughs> was Prime Minister, there was huge fraud from the bounce back loans? Has he got any of that money back yet? We are always ferociously determined to recover money uh, that is obtained through fraud. Um, but because of those bounce back loans, we have the fastest recovery of any major European country. Final question, Jim Sundland. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I have recently been contacted by several self employed constituents in Bracknell expressing concern about heavy fines being imposed for filing tax returns late, even though no monies are owed. Would the Treasury please agree to meet with me with a view perhaps to reviewing this policy? Mm, yeah. Minister. Uh, 
I, I will, of course, be happy to meet my honourable friend. I, I hope he understands I can't intervene personally in any case, but I will, of course, look at the uh, general principle and see if there are systemic issues here that he um, sets out. Right, that completes questions. Let those leave before we come to the next part. Yeah.